Hello, hello. I think we are just getting started. I think there's a poll here for some of you just to trickle in. Please help to um, share a little bit of some of the biggest challenges that your organization is facing. So we'll take a minute to open the poll, and then we are about to get started. For some of you, how's everyone going? So I, I saw some of you already started. Um, we just take another minute before we get full on. Um, Christina, if you can help us to close the pool in probably one more minute, that'll be awesome. All right, we have concluded the poll. Most of the question, let's see, what's the result? Do we have the poll results somewhere? Majority of you having, the biggest challenge is 50% of the poll um, answer is around have clear visibility on strategies and goals. Um, then we have about uh, half of that goes to delivery more with the less resources and deliver on time, deliver commitment. And some of, none of you have challenges to manage requests from uh, revenue teams. That's great. That seems like um, um, fewer challenges here. And then 17% um, of you says all of the above. Wow. All right. Very fitting. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the CPO series. Um, my name is Becky Flint. I am the founder and CEO of Dragonbow. I'm excited to bring uh, the CPO series to our community of product leaders. Um, this series will be recorded. So if some of you would have questions and they want to join later, you can always find us uh, if you're registered with the, uh, with the session. Um, before I get started, just a quick overview of Dragonbow. Uh, Dragonbow is a product portfolio platform, and uh, we are here to enable product leaders to accelerate business outcomes. We offer a suite of products for road mapping, portfolio management, and outcome acceleration. And today we're adopted by more than 4,000 teams in over 60 countries and excited to further partner with the product leaders and, and many of you hopefully soon on how to drive more outcomes and work more effectively. Now, without further ado, I wanna introduce today's guest, um, Laura Marino. Laura is a very seasoned product leader of more than 25 years of experience in leading teams in large and small uh, spectrum um, business or B2B or B2B2C companies, including Nuance and Microsoft, InterApp, Lover, and more recently, TrueML, a fintech company using AI to reinvent debt resolution. Laura is passionate about um, teaching and promoting diversity and product management. She's a guest speaker and lecturer at Stanford University and uh, Los Angeles University in Columbia. And she's also a board member of the nonprofit Leading Women in Technology, where she promotes women's leadership. Laura is also an active member of our partners network, Women in Product, which uh, is the partner to, with Dragonmo to bring this series together. So without further ado, I would love to uh, you know, welcome Laura to today's session. Hi, Becky. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So um, we are super excited to bring Laura and have the conversation today around how we navigating the treacherous uh, trail around um, leading through economic, economic challenges. And many, many of you probably um, been around and see some of the happier times in the, in the past you know, a couple of years. Now, definitely, we see a new era of challenges with the experience Laura has um, and, and personally also um, gone through sort of the, the first uh, dot-com bus. This is my uh, good experience coming out of school. Uh, it's definitely a, a very, very uh, on-time topic for today. So uh, without further ado, we're going to uh, take off the screen sharing and really have the conversation around 
what we have learned and the stories, the wartime stories uh, and tips and learnings uh, navigating today's uh, water. So um, if you have questions, please go ahead and post into the, the question panel. And some of the questions that maybe we'll cover, so then we will not hold off a little bit. Some of the questions that may be more relevant, so we're going to go ahead and bring in. So um, and uh, just to open it up for a quick second, um, thinking about how we leading product today is a very, very different from what it was before. One of the things that we, um, some of you may have read, um, uh, Ben Horowitz wrote uh, a pretty famous essay about peacetime CEOs and wartime CEOs. Obviously, a lot of talks about how product leaders, the CEO of the product and whatnot, there's some similarities of leading in the sort of the peacetime and the wartime. So I'm going to kind of change that to you. What's your thoughts around this topic, Laura? Yeah, I, I actually prefer a different analogy than peacetime and wartime. When I think of the journey of a company, I think, and I'm a big hiker. So I think of a journey, a trek to a distant mountain and the summit of the mountain, that's the vision that the company has. And you are on this journey and you're on a trail. And what happens is that parts of the trail may be easy, the weather is great, and you're just moving up that trail as fast as you can. But then there are parts of the trail that are really difficult. The weather may change. You may find yourself in the mist, middle of a blizzard and you are much more in a sort of survival mode. So I, I see it that way. I think that chief product officers as they go on this journey with their companies are going to find the easier parts of the trail and the really difficult ones. And I do think that they need to adjust uh, to depending on where they are on the trail. Right, right. You're you're right. It's uh, it's more of sort of you're gonna have to have a diverse set of leadership skills and styles depending on where you are, and that's definitely more testing for some of the the newer members. So now, let's say in the journey when things are become a more you know easier time, let's maybe we can cover a couple of things. But let's since we're right now is really in a more challenging time, right? And and some people may or may not realize like, hey, we see the downturn. What's happening? But that's that really is sometimes you would almost say it's the it's a business as usual back to normal right in the best in the last maybe you know ten years or so there's a lot of uh, free funding uh, ample funding free interest uh, rate that really um, change how we work how do we drive growth at all costs or growth um, first and and the burn rate is something else. Now, with today, uh, a lot of companies, I'm pretty sure investors coming to us, the Wall Street coming to companies about profitability, profitable growth. So what, what are some of the, the, you know, how was your experience, Laura, in the past that, um, that this shift happened and how, you, how, how do you see company or your team manage that successfully? Yeah, and I think that what you were, uh, the point you were making, I do think that for about 10 years, we had this period of growth. And uh, I don't think that it was a normal period, but for people who really got into technology during those years, that's all they knew. I mean, this right. was up and to the right. And it was from the trail perspective, it's like people were sprinting up the trail as fast as they could using any resource they needed to just move very fast. And I think that for chief product officers and product leaders who essentially had lived primarily during those periods, seeing what's happening and what's been happening over the last year and a half can be very challenging because it's a very, very different situation and you do need to adapt. And so I think that uh, there are a couple of things that I think that chief product officers and product leaders can can start thinking about as they think of these changes. And I have like six, six specific pieces of, uh, I would say advice for the product leaders that are a little bit sort of uh, wondering what, what to do now that we're facing this very diff different period. And so the first thing which may feel a bit counterintuitive is continue to focus on your customers. 
when when things change, when the economics change and um, maybe the investors are saying we need to be profitable, there's the tendency, of course, to kind of look at what what do we need to do in the company? And that's a very important piece of it. But one thing to keep in mind is that when there's a macroeconomic change, that change is probably impacting your customers as well. So there's an important opportunity to say, OK, what does this mean to my customers? And is there an opportunity for me to help their new situation? And so as an example, when uh, when COVID hit, I was with Lever, and Lever was a company that sold software for recruiting. And pretty much overnight, we were all kept at home. And for those that may not remember, back then, people, whenever they were interviewing, they would go into the company. And so companies would have a pipeline of candidates and they might do a call initially for like screening, but then they would bring the candidates to the office and they would have panels and interviews. And of course, with COVID, that was no longer possible. And we had a lot of our customers with their pipelines of candidates that had been sort of scheduled for interviews that now they couldn't talk to. So we had started working on uh, embedding Zoom in the product to allow for video interviews. And we moved things around, accelerated that, and we were, within weeks, we were able to launch that. And it turned out to be incredibly helpful for our customers. And Lever was the first company to do that. Now everybody does. And, and as I said, now we're like thinking of, well, of course, you, you do video <laughs> interviews. Right. But that was a really important thing that we realized our customers needed. Right. That's right. Kind of I really like you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I really like how you said it. I think sometimes the people forget when we talk about focusing customers and people tend to think about customers as static, right? And it's not thinking, okay, I have my ICP, I have my persona. And the part really think about is the change effect to everyone. So this is a great example to show like not only you focus on customers, customer needs, and also understanding the change effect them. So that's awesome. So the second thing that I would say is you do need to switch to an optimization mode. And by the way, Dragon Boat had a great blog where it kind of lays out what it means to embrace this optimization mode. But it's, it's a time where you truly need to ruthlessly prioritize based on outcomes. And what that means is that you as the uh, product leader may to accept that you're going to postpone or put on hold exciting projects that you might have had that you knew were important for the future of the product. And so for example, at TrueML, uh, we were working on two new products that we knew were really part of that broader vision we had for the company for the future. And we were very excited about those, but those were products that didn't have any short-term path to profitability. And so when the economy started changing, we realized we had to put them on hold and really double down on the core business, even though, again, in the future, hopefully we'll be able to go back to them. But those are decisions that are really important to make when you see uh, things changing. Right. I, I totally hear you. Just like the mention you said earlier in the lever scenario, you invest in this new product to, that was never on the roadmap, right? That also means the things on the roadmap would have to be trade off the change. So you're going to do a bunch of scenarios, what ifs or others, so then you can drive either optimize for new change, new opportunity or optimize for revenue needs on the short term. So this is a really cool to have people think about prioritization needs to evolve so that you can optimize our focus. Right. And, and when you're changing priorities, this brings me to the third recommendation. You really need to ensure that there's alignment with the executive team. And as Shelly Perry, who has been on this webinar before, would remind you, as a chief product officer, your first team is the executive team. You are first and foremost a member of the executive team, and secondary, you are a functional leader. And during difficult periods, it's so critical that the executive team be aligned. And I saw in the poll, people were mentioning that one of the things that they struggle with is understanding the strategy. These are the times where the executive team needs to come together and look at what is needed for the benefit of the company. And as an executive, you really need to be thinking about the company and not as much about your team. And we 
we are very protective of our product teams and of engineering. I think every product leader feels responsible for protecting engineering as well. And that's normal. But when you are having kind of this situation, really it's the alignment of the executive team that's going to help the company move forward. Uh, I I I totally hear you. It's it's a it's a very very like the quote unquote the word protective is a very interesting term, right? I think um, I think uh, one of the difficult conversation quite often is both with the executive team and with the existing team, right? People are so passionate about their product. Engineers are so passionate about like the true M and I'm pretty sure like everyone's excited about the future, how innovative it is. Now all of a sudden, quote unquote, this is no longer important, and that's kind of hard for people to say. I put in like my day and nights, I work long hours, and all of a sudden you say it's not important. So have you experienced that? How do you you kind of make sure you go through the transition of something that's the top priority, most important, all of a sudden something else becomes more, more important, like product leaders face it all the time. And, and then what's some of your advice to kind of go to the next level to keep your team aligned and, and feel still motivated, even though they're, you know, they're like, they're hard porting that a project or initiative are now being put on hold. Yeah, that actually points to another one of the recommendations that I have, which is communication, communication, communication. As uh, the product leader, you actually have pretty unique visibility as to what's happening with the business, what's happening in the market, what's happening with the customers. And it's your responsibility to be able to explain that to the product and engineering teams especially when you have teams that are working very excited on some initiatives that may be very strategic and you have to come and say, we're going to uh, stop working on those. And those decisions typically come from the top down, right? You have a lot of things that are bottoms up. The team has figured out what are the best um, initiatives to move forward certain metrics that they want. But when there's a decision that we need to stop doing something because we need to retrench, those decisions typically come from the top. So for making sure that those teams understand why. I am a big, big believer in transparency. I've been very fortunate that I've been in companies that tend to be very transparent. Right. And one of the things that you really need to do is be able to explain to the product and engineering teams the why. Why are the, what are the business reasons why this needs to happen. Engineers are very data driven. So if you can show them the data and, and they are all part of the business, they all want the company to be successful. If right. you're able to explain why for this period, it's just important to reassign uh, the resources on things that may bring shorter term revenue, right. they will understand. And in terms of communication, uh, having sort of a source of truth, and this is, I think, where the Dragon Boat platform is a good example, having a source of truth, truth for people to know what are the current priorities and what the, are the expected outcomes become very important. Because if you are switching priorities to uh, align with the reality, with the business reality, that means that things will change for the sales team may have been expecting things that now are deprioritized. Engineering product, we're focusing on things that now are different. So there has to be like one source of truth so that the whole company has visibility as to where the company is going for the next period. Right. It's it's just so critical is that um, especially in the software world, there's just so much collaboration happening, you know, from executives to the team between different teams. So not having the transparency, not have a source of truth, it's almost impossible to be effective. So I think that it's a really great call out in providing data and, and provide clarity and then communication in different formats. This is awesome. So what are some of the other uh, 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 suggestions, devices? Well, there's two more, and I think that those are probably some of the more difficult and more important ones. One is you need to be ready to make difficult decisions because frequently when you face a serious economic downturn, improvement in operational efficiency, focus, all of those things, they may not be enough. And so what happens is companies are faced with having to really have some structural changes, and that may mean layoffs. And for anybody who's a leader, going through layoffs is probably the most painful piece of your job. 
and it impacts people personally. It may impact you personally, but it is potentially the only thing that can save the company. It may be an existential threat. When I was at Lever, and again, COVID hits, we are a company selling recruiting software. And all of a sudden, the companies were busy laying off people. Who was going to buy recruiting software? And we were in a situation we were going to go out for funding. And certainly, with what was happening, there was no funding to be had. So as an executive team, we came together and started looking, what do we need to do? And we realized that we had to cut really, really deep to make the company self-sufficient so that it could really survive whatever long that period was going to be before it could start growing again. And this was, I think, in my experience, the most painful thing because we had built such a wonderful team at Lever. And I had grown my team and every single person that was part of my team was great. And engineering, we had grown engineering a lot. Everything had grown. And with the executive team, we agonized. We went through iterations and iterations of how much we had to cut. We ended up having to cut 40% of the company. And as part of that, and again, remember you as a chief product officer, a share, shareholder in the company, I had to leave because there was no reason for me to stay after we were going to cut my team to a, something smaller than it was when I first joined. So it is, I mean, this idea that you better be ready for really tough decisions is an important one. And then the other consideration, when you have to go through those tough decisions, it is also important how you do that, because it is during those difficult times that the true values and culture of a company become visible. And I think we all read some horror stories at the beginning of this economic downturn on how companies handle things. But when you have to go through a layoff, the way you treat the people who are being impacted, the way you communicate and treat the people who are left behind, because you need to rally them to continue, it really demonstrates the values of the company. And one thing about the article by Ben Horowitz. In his article, he says that uh, peacetime CEOs take time defining the culture, that wartime CEOs lets the war define the culture. And I completely disagree with that. I think that cultivating a strong company culture is like an ongoing investment in a savings account. You get to a rough time and that's when you can actually dip into that account. Or if we think of our trail uh, analogy, it is like the fitness and strength that you're building along the journey that will allow your team to really dig deep when they get to those really rough patches. And you cannot expect that strength to be built once you're already in the really tough patch. So I feel strongly that building a strong culture and having strong values is what helps companies through those periods. And, and I've been very fortunate that I've been in companies that have strong values, partly because that's what I look for. Right. And, and I completely agree with you is that how strong is the culture, how, how much depth you have in your, in your employee, in your beliefs and the values and the leadership team really define in many ways whether the company is going to make it or not. It's not necessarily the other way around, right? So you, it's like the more you invest in the team, in, in the leadership, in the culture that would really drive that your ability, increase your ability to go through. So, wow, it's a, it's a lot of uh, really great insights. So I know our time is short today, so let's do a quick takeaway, Laura, of some of the things you key, uh, you highlighted, six, five, five key takeaways. Um, so with that, um, I also wanna open up to some of the questions for the audience. We have a little bit of time uh, left. One of the question is, how do you decide which investment to prioritize? I think that this is where you really need to start aligning with what are the objectives of the company. When you are um, at kind of part of the leadership of a company, leadership has to align as to what is the long-term view, but also what is going to be the, what are the business goals for the shorter term? If you are going through a downturn, the company may realize that they need to focus on profitability or they need to focus on net retention. So the executives need to align on what are the most important business goals that they have for that period. 
And at that point is when you start with the team more bottoms up saying, what, which of our initiatives would best serve those business goals? So I really believe that it's a tops down, bottoms up approach with the business defining what are the key business goals, the team saying, given those business goals, we think this were the best initiatives. This is this is the perfect. It's a totally the strategy, and and in many ways, I think you know in the past uh, years, and in, if I want to say what led to the start of Dragon Ball, really is that there's either a top down command and control sort of way, like the waterfall era, right? And then that's not going to be good. Or is it completely autonomous? Then you have no strategies, a lot of confusion that people don't know what's going on, where to prioritize. That's a half the, the attendees kind of say, I don't know the strategies goals because you don't have a way to connect that. How can I give the clarity, the top-down alignment on strategy and goals and that you that can truly empower the team to have autonomy to say how I'm going to prioritize my roadmap to contribute to that. This is awesome to hear. Same term you're coming through. Uh, we have one more question, um, I think kind of related. So what are some of the more tactical, practical tips and ensure the alignment within executive teams, uh, especially if you are relatively new in the, in the, in the company, uh, you know, going through this as a, you, maybe you're new brought into company to, to handle these challenges or, or the, you know, various reasons as a new CPO, uh, what will be your, your tips? There's, when you're new, you have a certain advantage. When you're coming in, my recommendation is before you dive in immediately, spend time with each of the executive team members to kind of understand where they are coming from, understand their views so that you can paint a picture of sort of what are their main concerns, what are their main things, because then you can start speaking their language, right? The sales leader is going to be under a lot of pressure, right? And they are... Uh, and then you may have uh, the finance person or the marketing team. So you want to come in and really just listen to what they're saying, because then you can start reflecting sort of their needs, but you can start guys explaining why you may be focusing on one area and what it will mean for them. So take advantage of being new to really listen. And once you've listened, start trying to bring together all that you heard and say, explain to them how what you're trying to do on the product strategy aligns or not with what they need. Right, right. It's a really great call out. And it's really tied back to some of the key things about how your executive teams, your, your first team, right? So you get a lawyer team, you're going to sort of the forming storming side of things and also talking about the communication, right? You have clear data and alignment. So that's really helpful around that. I know we're short on time. This is a so packed with the inside advice. So thank you so much, uh, Laura, for joining us today. And then Laura, is, you know, I also want to call out our partner, Women in Product. Very proud to have a, such a strong community for women in product leadership. But obviously, all of, of us can benefit from that, women or otherwise. So, um, and thank you for Women in Product to partner on this series. And you can find Laura here on LinkedIn, additional content you can find and the resources on Dragon Boat as well. Now, um, as we probably know, um, to make effective change, to be effective, you need the right tool, the right tool for the right job, if I would. And to achieve a lot of things we try to accomplish here, especially in challenging times, you do need the right software, the right platform to help you make decisions, to help you to drive alignment. So uh, that's why Dragon Ball is a form. If you want to know more how Dragon Ball may help you, um, check out Dragon Ball uh, at the dragonball.io slash CPO. And we'll be excited talking to you as well. So in closing, we have one minute. Any other last question that we have here um, from, from the audience? Okay, there's additional insight on leadership coaching circle at the women, um, at the um, women in product. Uh, so you can see on the chat there's additional content, uh, additional resources here in how you may book um, coaching sessions um, on um, being a product leader. Thank you, Laura. This is a fantastic. Oh, thank you for having me. I do uh, echo, I mean, Women in Product has great resources. Check it out. Also for 
women who are listening to this, I always pitch uh, leading women in technology. This is the nonprofit that I'm part of. And it's a great program. It's essentially to help women who are already sort of mid-career advanced in their careers get to the next level. It's not just for product, but uh, check it out at lwtleadership.org. And, and I think that it, it's, a, it's a very helpful program for those who want to move forward in their careers. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thanks, everyone. Until next time.